a person that has lost much of the time at home with a great family, but has gained for all the rest of us the determination and the spirit and the cooperation. And one that I'm very pleased to work with and one that is an outstanding leader that could not give more because he is giving it all. And when you think of people, of what they are contributing to helping others, the greatest sacrifice of all is being away from a family, and he has a large family, willing to travel day in and day out and week in and week out and to keep the, in touch with that family at home by telephone. A one that dearly loves his family, but one who is using his ability to help every farmer, farm family in this nation whether they be members of the NFO or whether or not, working through the NFO to help people in rural America. One who can give you a vision and an insight as to what it takes because he's there. That what he is willing to do as your leader. So at this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the capable and sincere and dedicated Vice President of the National Farmers Organization, Devon Woodland. Thank you. In 1968, in this city, I attended my first convention of this organization. Some 10 years ago, I came with you to commit myself to a cause that you heretofore had committed yourself to. And I felt at that time that I had a responsibility to give of myself to that which I believe to be true and right. And regardless of whom we may be as individuals, we have to make a decision in our life as to what we believe in. And in fact, if we believe in that which we profess, we have the responsibility to commit ourselves to the cause. And if you as individuals do not believe in what you're doing, then we have to rearrange our priorities and get those ideals reestablished. Each time that I have the opportunity to meet with many of you in your homes, in your community, in your meetings, I have one desire as I do so. And that is to leave a constructive thought every time I have the opportunity. And I would hope that as you assemble here and as you assemble in commodity meetings or county, district, or state, that where the opportunity presents itself, that you too would leave a constructive thought that would promote that in which you believe. I consider myself extremely for fortunate. I have the best of two worlds. I know most of you personally, having been in your areas and in your meetings. And I also know personally those who represent and work in your behalf, in the staff, in the leadership of this organization. And I only wish that each of you 
know them as I do. And I wish that they know you as I do. The endless hours that each of us, in our way, contribute to what we believe in. I think we have many people that don't really know to what extent we have dedicated, capable, determined, if you will, people in the membership out there as well as in the executive body, your national board, your people who represent you in the commodities within the structure of the Home Office. And I feel extremely fortunate to know both of them well and know many of their heartaches in success, know many of the disappointments as they become discouraged. And because of that relationship as those who would represent you, try to impose my desires, my will, my philosophy, my thoughts on them to make them better because of that association that we have one with another. Nine years ago, I started out knocking on doors up and down the road, as many of you have, going from a section of my county to a county, to a combination of counties, to the state, to a combination of states, and I know all the heartaches, disappointments, discouragement that can come from that type of thing. But I believed in what I was doing, and I've never missed a convention since. And in those early days within the structure of the organization, I heard board members stand and testify to me that they believed this organization was true and the principles were right and correct and that we would succeed. I heard district, state, and county leaders do the same. I heard Oren Lee time and time again, Fink, Brana, assure me that we would win. I always had that question of doubt that I would ever see it happen. Not that it wouldn't happen, but that I may not see it in my lifetime. After nine years, the last 12 months, I've been sitting in the office most of the time. I've been sitting next to those people who are making it happen for us in the bargaining area, negotiating, in the contract negotiations. Those that have direct contact with those people whom we heretofore have regarded as our adversary. And I've seen the look on their face when they have succeeded in their efforts. And they would come and say, I've got something to tell you. And they would show me a contract. They would tell me about a conversation. If you have never believed me before, I want you to believe me now. I know that I'm going to see it happen. I know that we can cause it to happen in this convention. I'm convinced that all we've got to do is decide what we want, and we can cause it ha to happen. I've never seen the programs, I've been involved in the programs over the years, and there's been some of them that's been just a little hard for me to sell because I didn't know or didn't think that maybe it would be totally workable. And I want to assure you that that doubt 
is gone. There has never been a time within the structure of this organization when the programs have been more finely tuned and have more capability of succeeding and filling that dream that for years we have talked and thought about. There has never been a time in this organization when we have a staff of people, and I submit to you the best staff of people in any industry in this country. And I'll put them up again any company, any corporation. And I'll tell you why I'm so confident in our ability to succeed. It's because of a combination between those people and you and I. If you and I were to go into a football game, and on our team as producers we had perfected our plays and our signals and we knew exactly what we were going to do at the tip of the ball, our chances of succeeding and suppressing the foe would be 50% if they had practiced and rehearsed too. But I'll tell you when some of the foe's team is now on your team and they tell you the calls and the plays, you have an unbeatable combination. And I submit to you today that we have an unbeatable combination on our team, you and I. Decide in our own minds what we want to do. Those who serve you, and if you look at the center, I was going to say center fold, but maybe the center section of the brochure, you'll see a group of people there who are highly trained and highly qualified to serve in the areas in which they have been assigned to serve. And nearly without exception, each of those have farm backgrounds, interests, desires, and determination. Nearly without exception. And one exception to that would be our legislative assistant who's recognized as the most effective farm legislative assistant in Washington. And when farm issues began to be discussed, without exception, he's called, invited in. And as many of you know who have worked with him, his ability to know when to push, where to push, how hard, when to pull back, the timing, and that comes with years and years of experience, can only come from that type of training. Another man there who may not have a farm background is he in charge of the sheep division. But as a young boy spent his early years, 14, 15, and 16 years old, in the yards in Omaha, and was taught every trick of the trade until he got a belly full of it, and decided at that point he was going to work for the cause of farmers. And today, with pride, he represents the largest block of sheep in this country because of you. I could go through the entire list of those that are listed there, and nearly without exception, farm backgrounds, with that desire to see farmers receive equity and justice. In visiting with one of those who is a veteran in Washington, I confidentially asked him a question, and he was very open with me as we sat in a corner secluded. I said, do you think that we're going to make it? About a year ago, two years ago, I asked him the question, do you think that we're really going to make it? And he said, you know, history says you won't. But remember who made history? People did. He said, I thought perhaps NFO had met its Waterloo when we had our 
disagreements with some of the government agencies in this country? He said, I would have given up then, but you didn't. Again, you were attacked and you didn't. The companies organized to weaken your position, you didn't fail. You performed a miracle, and who am I to say that you won't perform another one? I submit to you, there was no miracle performed. It was simply determination and dedication of people who believed in and decided as a group that this, in fact, is the direction in which we wanted to go. I don't think that we talk about winning or losing anymore. I think we talk about winning. We're not going to spend much time in this convention as you meet further on into the convention and the commodity meetings. We're not going to be talking about the problem. We're going to be talking about the solution to that problem that we're well aware of. We're going to spend our efforts and our energies to help you understand and involve you in that solution. We know what it is, the solution. We know what has to be done, and we want you and those who may not be here to understand and become a part of that solution. But I can guarantee you of some things that are going to happen, irregardless of the decisions that you and I may make here today. There are things that will happen that will affect you that you absolutely have no control over. One, interest rates are going to affect you and your farming operations, and regardless of what you say or do is going to touch you. Inflation is going to touch you and your farming operation, which you have no control over. There is going to be group action among people in this industry. I can also guarantee you that there are going to be fewer independent businesses in this country. And much to our chagrin, there may be fewer independent farmers, owner-operators. And you may be part of the last generation of independent farmers and ranchers in this country. This doesn't have to happen, but I can assure you that it is on the planning board. The last statistics that we had access to in the last few weeks reports to us that we are losing, having an attrition rate of independent farmers today of 2,000 per week. It used to be 2,500, you know, and it's dropped some now. But the owner-operator has strength in po and power in group action. And through that medium was his only possibility of survival. This organization accepts the responsibility to give you and I the chance to do something for ourselves. No one really knows for sure how much foreign money is now invested in American agriculture. No one seems to be able to find out exactly what that figure is, but Estimates are that 40% of the real estate sales in agriculture in the state of California is foreign money. And it's highly likely that similar percentages would reach into the other heavy agriculture areas of this country. Projections are that by the mid-80s, if current trends continue, that 30% of American agriculture could be in foreign hands. The only country in the world that allows the foreign investors to come in and purchase their natural resource. Someday, and I think not in the too distant future, 
Congress is going to recognize the error, and action will be taken to stop it. And I feel certain in my mind that when that time happens, inflated land values that you and I have borrowed monies against, inflated land values that we have borrowed monies against to buy equipment, other farms, because now the buyer list will be reduced, and that inflated price that we have been exposed to in purchases and mortgages will no longer be there. In a matter of months, we could find ourselves in economic straits. I think we have to decide, and I can recall a hymn that was sung or a song that was sang as a youngster that went something about what will the harvest be. This organization now is ready for the harvest. We went out years ago and we planted that seed. And as time moved on, we tended it, we cultivated, we put on the herbicide, the insecticide, we done all that we could to protect it. And we done all that we could in this organization to protect it in its infancy as it was attacked by the outer elements. We done what we had to do in daylight hours and in nighttime, long hours at night, working with our people to make that realization become a reality when the crop was mature. I think there's a direct parallel between those of us who till the soil, who have a direct relationship with that soil and this organization. It would be pure folly for those of us as we begin to farrow the hogs and move them into the fattening pens to quit feeding them at about 150 pounds. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't turn the water off of the fonts and cattle. We wouldn't forget to close the spigot on the bottom of the bulk tank in milk. Yes, we had done all the preparatory work in preparing for the harvest. And that last few surges of effort or energy that determined whether or not you succeed or failed, at that time, whether you determined whether your bottom line was going to be red or black, you would surely be there. And I submit to you that this organization now has reached that point of maturity to where the harvest is ours. We have taken it through the adverse conditions. We have taken it through those who have attacked and attempted to destroy, minimize, and discourage. And we're here. And victory is so close that you can nearly reach out and touch it. I want to assure you that I'm convinced, and if you have never believed me before, believe me now, it's ours for the asking, ours for the asking, when you and I decide together. And I ask you again, you tell me, what is the harvest going to be? Thank you. Thank you. To introduce the director of our Washington office, our legislative representative, who I believe if you talk to your congressman and senator, they or senators, they will agree that the NFO has the best in Washington, D.C. Chuck Fraser, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to this delegate body.
Thank you very much, President Staley. My only problem at this point in the proceedings is, uh, number one, how do you follow a good speaker like Devon Woodland, and secondly, how do you produce an encore if we manage to make a couple of good licks in 1978? I'm not sure I can promise you or repeat on that FMHA legislation or two or three of the other things, but we do have some plans, and there will be some challenges. And I know I'll be getting in touch with you again before the year's over for some help on some of the actions that we will have up back in Washington. Before proceeding further, of course, I do want to tell you that it's a pleasure to be back here and see you again. I think we Missourians have contributed a little to the conference already this year. We've got some nice weathers compared to that storm that was blowing through Milwaukee a couple of years ago and that cold wave that hit Omaha. I again have with me at this meeting our legislative director in the Washington office, Ms. Ann Bornstein. Some of you know her. I would like for her to stand so you could give her a hand. She's a hard worker for farmers. I also must take just a moment to express appreciation for those of you who as directors, members of the board, state presidents, district presidents, and others who have responded to some of our phone calls at one time and another through the year, and who have helped us with letters, telegrams, or calls to the members of the Congress and the Senate when we needed some help in Washington. It is always worth remembering. Those people in the Congress, regardless of which party they may belong to, regardless of who's in charge of the White House, they are always conscious of, aware of, and responsive to the beliefs, the attitudes, and the ideas of the people right out here on the farms. It's most important, and it is a thing that we try to keep in mind in operating the Washington office. Now, I don't have any jokes today, and I can't even say that this is uh, like the flight of the Italian pilot with good news and bad news. But I thought it might be helpful since it's the end of the year. We are going with a new Congress in Washington in just a matter of a few more days. We have substantial changes in some of those delegations, Texas, California, Minnesota, a number of other states to kind of review where we stand, not necessarily in your eyes from the country or even from mine in running our Washington office, but perhaps the attitudes that prevail in Washington, the setting, if you please, in which we will be operating over the next year. For example, I think this is a time when economists, political leaders, influential people in the financial world are all watching these interest rates. They're all concerned about the effect of this inflationary process that's been working so hard on us in this economy over the last year or so and what may be in store for us in the future. I think this matter of inflation, the President's effort to deal with it, and the effect of continuing rising costs of oil and other sources of energy are going to set the stage for what we may or may not be able to accomplish in Washington. I think those major trends or factors, should I say, are going to continue to push interest rates up for a while. I think they're going to 
bear on the attitudes in the Congress as well as in the minds of the people who advise the president and make up budgets. I believe they're going to have an influence on almost everything in which we are interested back there in Washington. Just for example, it's not pleasant to recall, but we should remember that the dollar today has declined to just about half what it was worth in 1967. In other words, in a 10-year period. Now, it's not the first time we've had this. We had a round of similar decline a few years ago. We normally have such a problem at some point after each war. But in this particular case, to do a little Monday morning quarterbacking, I think the combined leadership of both political parties in this country now recognize that very serious efforts were made a few years ago at the time of the Vietnam War. Insufficient steps were taken to control spending in the domestic economy. I think the leadership in both parties failed to recognize the effect of trying to fight a war and also pay for the bread and butter. And as we all know, the whole thing has been amplified or made worse by the OPEC countries and their oil pricing policy and all of the consequent fallout that's hit us in the form of rising costs of production. Those two single large influences are still with us today. And if I were going to make any predictions, I would have to guess that the same factors are going to bear heavily on us at least into next year and probably for some time after that. Now, every farmer knows what's happened to our cost of production. Everyone out here in the country knows that we've had these up and down cycles running in these farm prices. I guess we can't hold the politicians responsible for failing to anticipate the drought in some other country abroad a few years ago that gave us temporarily favorable grain prices. And I guess, too, that it would not be re responsible on our part to anticipate that politicians, economists, financial world people, or anyone else is going to produce the answer for us in the future. It is becoming, in my humble opinion, increasingly important that we look to the, our own resources and be able to price our own products. I think we've just got to resolve that we need more cooperation among all farm and ranch people to get this job done and of course, you and I know the NFO way is the way we can accomplish it. Now, to put this thing in context with legislation, the Emergency Credit Act that Mr. Staley referred to a moment ago, the other legislation that we had in 1978 and the Secretary's action in raising wheat target prices, in setting up the federal or the farmer held reserve of grain. To keep all this in proper context, I think it may be important to acknowledge that the credit route or borrowing more money 
and bidding against each other for the equipment and the land may not be any answer. Just for example, on the program Mr. Staley mentioned, FMHA made 153,400 new farm loans this last year. They put out 3.6 billion to farmers under those new credit arrangements. Now we may learn under another piece of legislation passed how much land's being purchased by foreigners. We may learn that we can get an act passed that will change the import quotas on beef, give us some relief at a time cow numbers are up and we have problems on beef prices again. I think we can get some of these things done back there in town. But I surely would hope that while we work on bargaining and while we work on new membership and while we do our utmost to commit more commodities and more volume for commodities moving through the NFO, that we are able to do this without encouraging some of our young farmers to try to borrow their way out of this problem and without leading them to believe that Washington political decisions are going to offer any other alternative or any other route that we can take financially in farming in this country. It would be a mistake to assume that even our best friends back in Washington are going to get us out of this pricing problem without their efforts to do it right out here in the country. While we talk about changes in prices, costs, and so on, there's a couple of facts that rather highlight the whole thing. We mentioned 1967 and the value of the dollar a moment ago. I don't think you need to be reminded of any numbers to show what that's done. But just to firm it up, in that same 10-year period, all our average farm prices have gone up about 114 percent. All of our costs of production have gone up about 130 percent. And even though we had a high gross farm income last year, the net income declined. And it's perfectly predictable that we will be subjected to the same squeeze this next year if we have good weather. Now, of course, we've got a few bright spots. Livestock look a little better. When I was up home the other day, the old boys were all enjoying those coffee cups now, or at least those that had feed your calves to sell at 72 to 82 cents a pound. No one's saying very much about what, how the feeder's going to come out. And I suspect that some of this division of opinion will be reflected back there in town in the Congress. If we go in there in this next round expecting to find some cure on the cost price squeeze that's hit us out here in the country in the form of new legislation, I'm quite sure some people are going to remind me of the price of hogs and the price of cattle out here in the country today. Now they certainly aren't high by your standards and mine, but they are high enough that somebody's going to feed it right back to me. And there isn't any use for us to kid ourselves. We need a better answer on grains. Milk surplus is down some. 
CCC has not been taking in as much milk this year as they did a year ago. The people back in Washington who are feeling compelled to worry about budgets and spending are perfectly well aware of the fact that you had about you had some referendum of some sort on budgets and taxes in at least 13 states in this last election. They're going back to town with that in mind. I think they're going to be feeling that we're doing pretty good on that livestock, that the dairymen are breaking even, and that's supposed to be good for you, you know. And it's going to be hard to talk to them about raising loan rates or target prices on grain or something of that sort as long as we're still planting it fence to fence out here in the country. I believe that as we go out to these grain farmers and talk about bargaining and blocking and holding this grain and using the ASC program and the farm loans and the farm reserve all as one package to hold some of this grain off. We might also do some of our younger farmer members a favor to encourage them not to go whole hog and keep trying to bust it fence to fence and outproduce a market that just may not absorb this extra billion bushels of wheat or the extra billion bushels of corn that we've got racked up in this country. If we can export it, I know good and well, Berglund and everyone else would like to ship it out of here. But they may or may not get a chance to move grain of that quantity out of this country. And all of our efforts to move that quantity of grain out of here may come to naught if they have good weather in other areas of the world. These good old-fashioned concepts are the ones I think we've got to think about right out here in the country. We may need some more conservation in some of these farms. We may need to cut back on some of the fence-to-fence -fence operation. And we could couple that with bargaining, and then we can do something about grain prices on our own. Now, getting back to my end of the operation, I'd like to close by mentioning one other thing to you. It, too, is not necessarily a happy trick, but you must be aware of it. A few months ago, as a result of pressures in this country that had been building up for a number of years, the President and the Congress set up a commission to review the antitrust exemptions that are now a matter of law in this country. Most of us forget that the airlines, the railroads, even truck transportation, the insurance business, and the rate-setting structure that's effective in most states, each of these phases of our major economy, major phases of our economy, are operating under an exemption to the antitrust laws that otherwise would prevent them from talking to each other. Now, obviously, it is of importance to us to watch what this commission is going to do because one of the major exemptions to the antitrust laws is our Capra-Volstead Act, under which this organization and practically all the major farm cooperatives in this country are formed. To be effective, We've got to keep it in the right perspective. I would urge you to think of it calmly. I would urge you to understand that this is not some dire communist plot or some uh, Wall Street effort to undermine farmers' cooperatives or something of that sort. The truth of the matter is that many responsible leaders in this country have been concerned for a long time because the major antitrust suits that they undertake from Justice Department through the courts 
to enforce the antitrust laws and promote competition in this country drag on seven, ten years. Please turn the tape over to side number two. Some of those